Good evening, everyone. I'm going to do a journey on Blue Avions today, and Gabby and Jessica is doing the same thing. So it's pretty interesting to see her all her different perspectives. And it's always fun to do different perspectives, to see how they turn out, to see how they look, to see how they flow, to see how each individual has their own interpretation of what these beings are and what they're here for than the messages. It's always better to hear multiple perspectives on something. And then you can take out the things that feel closest to your heart to be able to use in yourself. Because everybody's an individual, everybody does something different, and everyone has something to give. Nasa kiramaniya tasan. So cool. Now, it's gonna simply light a candle here. I've been being called to do this regularly for some reason. And I do this, I've been doing this regularly. I always use beeswax candles. And um, yeah. So it is what it is. I'm surrounded by a bunch of friends lately. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I have this guy, this angel, uh, which is also silver. This uh, reminds me a lot of a uh, raven. It's black tourmaline, smoky quartz, and um, this is from Peru. This is another guy here, which is Amethyst Skull. And one of these guys, and a big chunk of black tourmaline as well. And that's originally from a much larger piece. Don't ask, that story is pretty tragic. Um, that's one of the smaller pieces. It was quite gigantic. Anyway, and I have these two wonderful ones as well. And a piece I've had since 1988. Actually, a totem I got in Vancouver Island when I was 13 years old. And it's kind of stuck around. So it has a lot of sentimental value as well as one of the few things that have since I was that age. Which is another tragic story. <laughs> which we can leave for any other day we want. So I just like to show you sometimes what I have. And obviously the center is this which also has black tourmaline in the back. Um, this is labradorite, penicite, two, four different um, directions. You really can't see it that well, but you see more there. And um, uh, <laughs> I've got a brain, a brain freeze right now. There's not, nothing's coming out. The Moldavite piece, which is much bigger than it is because it's covered up with silver. And it's also um, Tanzanite and Ametrine piece. It's a beautiful piece. It's, it's silver and gold. Um, I, have it, I, got it, I had it handmade years ago because I was asked to make it. Uh, I kept giving an image in my mind. So I actually went on Photoshop and Illustrator and created the piece. And I had a gentleman in Aurora, Ontario make it for me. He did, a, he did an amazing job of recreating the piece. Originally, I was going to have it solid in the back. This is solid silver. and But he talked me out of it, which I'm glad he did, because the piece is, would be way too heavy. And it wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been able to put this piece of black tourmaline in it, which really makes the energy flow really nicely through the piece, and it also balances everything out. So, yeah. It's, it's, the wings are Egyptian, believe it or not. The piece is a very heavily Egyptian piece to it, but also the plus sign or the plus cross or... Whatever you want to call it, it has a lot of meaning to me. It's like the Crusader Cross. It's it's a mainly some people call it the Iron Cross, but it's not really. It has so it's one of the older crosses actually. 
and I don't know why, but it has very strong meaning to me in, in many ways. Is like I was very close to that cross for many years. So anyway, just to give you a, a, a little hindsight of what this piece is like. But anyway, that's enough talking about things. But I think sometimes surrounding yourself with items makes you, it, it, it actually helps the flow of energy. Each piece has its own memory. This actual piece is, and this piece were part of the same thing. And this was about this big. And like it just, you know, I don't want to tell you that story because there's a lot of, uh... anyway, there's a lot of stuff about that I don't want to bring up. I've had quite the trip, the experiences, the journey in the last uh, four or five years. And it's still going. And it's, everybody goes through difficult times but you learn a lot during that time about yourself about life in general and the importance of what life is and it's it teaches you a lot of stuff but everybody thinks that your story is the only story and people think like they will see people that do videos and they don't see the background history of everything and the struggles they've been through. And I've been through some really, really difficult struggles. And one of the things that helped me through that time is talking to people. Um, me and Abby have worked together for many years and we've helped each other out through some pretty difficult times. And it's important to understand that everybody has a story in life and when you look at somebody don't judge them for what simply what you see because what you see is just simply nothing except a picture an image and they have all have amazing stories to tell and someday if we're sitting around drinking coffee or tea then maybe i'll tell you but i'm not bringing it up in the video at this time because <laughs> i get so many of them so anyway, I'm just looking at these and I don't know if you've really seen this. This is a very unique piece that is like, a, it's a labradorite angel that has silver bottom and wings. It's really quite beautiful. Again, this would be worn as a pendant, but realistically it's too big, it's too heavy. It's actually, it's almost as heavy, if not heavier than this. This piece is almost heavier than this piece. It'd be like trying to wear this around your neck. It just doesn't really work. And I don't wear, I used to wear this piece all the time, but I don't so much anymore. I do it in the videos because I'm being called to do that. And before I never used to show it, but then there's a reason why it needs to be shown because it's part of the energy transfer with me between me and you. And so are all these. And people always get freaked out about skulls. I think skulls are amazing, especially ones that have holes in them. <laughs> I don't know why. <clears throat> I love spheres with cracks and holes and skulls with cracks and holes. I find that they're all extremely unique. You can have a polished skull and it'll all look the same. But as soon as you find the pieces that have open crystals that let all the energy flow out, they're all unique and they're all beautiful. And I find crystals amazing. And I've, I've had so a lot of things over the years that I've given away as well. And that's the other thing. Crystals make beautiful gifts. And I think every piece is unique in its own way. Hmm. And all, even the craftsmanship about I know I, I just I've just been kind of reminiscent of a lot of things I've every piece that I've gotten and the, and the story behind it like a lot of these pieces were hand-picked some of them were not but a lot of them were it's always better when you can go in person and actually go through all the crystals and, and one reaches out to talk to you and each one has its own unique story 
And there is a lot of spirits attached to crystals. They speak through the crystals. And so in some rare cases, there is actually spirits inside the crystals. Now, that isn't as common as them talking through the crystals. And anyway, I'm just rambling on for 10 minutes <laughs> about crystals and about things in life. And I think part of the reason I'm doing this is because what is important is that sometimes you gather things in your life, you lose them all, you give them away, you start over, and then you gather more. And there's something about having specific items in your life that you don't necessarily have to keep for a lifetime. Because sometimes having stuff is weighs you down. It makes it hard for you to move around and to travel and to do all kinds of other things. However, at times, having things isn't bad. Like, things aren't bad. Because they all have a story. And you can, as long as you can let them go. It's when you can't let something go, there's something... It's, it's almost like it has control over you in a way. It doesn't mean just because you like something a lot or you love something that you have to give it up. But you, you still have to look at things as saying they're just things. And if somebody else could enjoy them just as much as you do. And I think that's beautiful, though. It's when you get trapped into things that, over, that you can't let go of and it becomes a succession. And that's when it gets bad. That's when it gets difficult. That's when it gets dangerous. Anyway, enough of this. I'm going to go into the journey into the avions because time flies by. And what I like to do too, I know I'm going on about it, I usually take a piece that's in front of me and I like to hold it. A lot of times I hold this because this crystal is very unique and it has a lot of meaning behind it as well. And so I like to just periodically decide what I'm going to pick up. For some reason, they want me to hold. Uh, they want me to hold this. So I hold this in my left hand, and I usually play with other things in my right hand. And you don't even know it because it's out of frame. <laughs> so this is what I have in my hand right now. I think at first when I had this, I wasn't even aware. And then Abby showed me, it looks very much like a raven. And it does really remind me of ravens, because ravens, I think, are amazing creatures, amazing birds. They're very spiritual, and they're very misunderstood. And that represents a lot of people, isn't it? They're misunderstood. And ravens aren't black. If you shine bright light, bright light on a raven, they are not black. They are purplish color. They, they have purplish throughout their whole body. And when you shine light through their wings, it's actually quite beautiful. It's amazing how we just assume that something is a specific thing or a specific color based on how we see it at a specific time. But what happens when we change our way of looking at something? When you look at something in the spirit realm, for instance, I can look at it as a solid, or I can look at it as pure energy. When you look at the spirit realm as pure energy, <clears throat> it gets very hard to navigate and find details because everything is flowing and everything. It's absolutely beautiful to look at. It reminds me of a painting. And because but but a painting that's flowing and constantly moving you can look at the energy world that way or you can look at it like a, the, the physical world it's easier to navigate through something that's physical than something that's constantly moving and flowing especially when you want to know details because realistically i don't think anything has any detail not the way that we see in the physical world because we're all made up of energy and when you actually look at the energy of what it is, when you adjust your eyes to see how we really look, we have energy that's constantly flowing from us. 
That is how we truly are. That's our true state of being. I'm going to close my eyes now and attach. I've already called upon the avions a long time ago. Maybe this is why I'm talking about all this stuff is because they want me to talk about it. Because I open myself up to these beings, I open myself up to what they're wanting to say. It isn't a coincidence I start talking about birds because blue avions are very much birds to me. They appear as a flock of birds. And I absolutely love animals and I love birds as well. I love all this. <laughs> There's a lot of animals I do like. There's very few I don't. And it would be such a tragic thing. It's, or it is a tragic thing that we lose an, a life form on this earth that never will be here again. That can't adapt to the changes of their environment, the changes of their land being taken away from them. They're not able to adapt, so they die off. Birds can adapt. Some birds can adapt. And that's an important message in itself because birds adapt to the changing of the environment better than almost any other animal. And because they have to, and they can fly, they can land in high places, they can keep themselves safe, even in a city. Why most animals don't really have that luxury. And their food is, is very diverse. And they could go, fly great distances to find food. Why, for instance, an an, most animals cannot. And, and they actually, the way they travel is much more dangerous. For instance, you have a fox. It kind of blends into a dog, but it still looks like a fox. But you have a squirrel, and it has to go across town every day to get food. That's going to be quite the trek. And will usually end up in tragedy very quickly. For instance, take a rabbit and do the same thing. A fox will have a better chance of surviving than any of those creatures I just mentioned if they have to go across town to find food. Most people will look at a fox and be like, that's a beautiful animal. Most people see a squirrel and say the same thing. But now when you, have to, when you talk about things that hide in the shadows, like rats, they can survive much better because they can go into the darkness and only come out at night. Hmm. But they're able to adapt their food to eat almost anything, and not all animals can do that. So they're talking to you about adaptations how to adapt to things and how do you actually adapt to change yourself how does the human race adapt to change are we adapting to change at all or do we simply die off the problem is is when we we don't when we, ch we change the environment around us, we kill other things in order to do it. And that's part of the problem, they're saying. So we don't, when we move into a new area, we destroy plants, we destroy animals, we destroy the land. In a way that's very, very destructive. at a balance. A, a perfect example would be like Mexico City, which is no, almost no life at all, like no organic life except human beings. Why not build p more parks? Why not have more trees? Why not have more areas that animals could survive? So the animals that used to live there would stand a fighting chance. But instead we just clear cut everything killing all life that isn't our own. That's a tragedy. We don't simply kill off 
animals, we kill off insects as well. Some will survive, but most of the insect population will be decimated. The animal population will be decimated. Most of the birds will die off as well, except for the ones that are able to adapt. Some birds will just move on quickly. Some animals would do the same thing. But then that, when they move into a new area, now it's overpopulated for a short time until nature brings things back into balance again, which usually means the death of many living things. We also could force a species of insects, of animals, into an area that they normally don't live, which the animals in that area aren't used to it or don't have any type of knowledge about the new creatures that are moving in. They have no defense mechanisms. They have no... no ability to adapt so they will be killed off which at one time they're living with prosperity so why is it that when we go into an area we just think of ourselves we don't even think of ourselves too though they're saying because we go in there we destroy the land or regrow maybe a tiny bit of it But do we realize that every time we do that, we're actually killing a part of ourselves because we're reducing the oxygen levels in that area, in the world as well. We can't simply just kill off all life. Then we'll have to come up with another way of creating oxygen to keep the air flowing, so to speak, the air recycling, the air constantly turning. Because what happens when we don't produce enough oxygen? The air changes, and then it becomes really difficult to breathe. And it continues to get worse and worse and worse and worse. It's funny, some animals might adapt. Some people will most likely build something to adapt. What happens to the animals and the, and the plants in the area? Will they be able to adapt? How much of the world would be able to adapt? A small portion of it will. But then what happens when we continue to push forward and continue to change, continue to reduce the oxygen levels? Less things can adapt. More things will die off. We will again create something else to produce oxygen within our own little environment. But forgetting about the things outside of our areas where we live. Outside our domes, if that's, how, if that's how bad things get. And at that point, we're just going to get used to the world dying. We're going to forget that there was ever life around us, except what's inside the domes. then the world will continue to die and we'll just continue to live inside our domes. Then we're going to notice it's going to be harder and harder and harder to produce things. The population of the world is, is now in trouble. People are dying. They're not able to adapt. The domes are becoming larger and larger and harder to maintain. Some break down. Some don't work properly anymore. There's a lot of fighting, shortage of food. You might even find a lot of people who are already gone from the planet gone to this gone to space to different parts of our solar system and maybe even different parts of our galaxy this is just one future they say a future where mankind doesn't learn to appreciate life instead just continues to destroy it the question is 
will the human race be allowed to leave its solar system if we do not learn to appreciate life? That's the question they want. they're asking everybody right now. Do you think the human race will be allowed to leave our solar system if we do not appreciate our own world? If we end up killing this planet, will we ever be able to leave? Because they're telling me they, there's nothing left in their, in their solar system that has life like Earth. So it, they really can't destroy life the way they destroy life on this planet. But they're telling me there's not a chance in hell we're going to be, this is the exact words they're using, to leave the solar system until we learn to appreciate life. It's quieting down. And I see a bunch of uh, birds, blue birds, flying around me right now. And they turn into people. And there's one, the lighting's really interesting on her. And And this one female has very beautiful headdress and dress, and it's like there's a, there's a she wears a dress that reveals her leg, which is like a really light white color. It's not white; it's more like um, like a human leg, but a little bit paler though. And she has a beautiful, really, really ornate dress and a headdress on her head. And she has a very regal look to her. And not just regal look, but a regal, uh, like, attitude, uh, presence about her. And she blows blue, blue petals. They're almost like rose petals, but they're blue. And I catch one of them in my hand. And something that feels so soft actually is not. It actually cuts my hand. And all these petals are actually not petals at all. And she talks about illusions and how sometimes things look so beautiful and innocent that are full of thorns, full of barbed wire, full of um, poison. And she turns into back into a very, very small girl and this small girl is very innocent looking, but she has a very large knife. And she cuts the head off a snake. Hmm. And, the, and it's like the head of the snake falls to the ground. And she looks up at me with a very serious look on her face. And she asked me, what do I think of that? Well, I asked her, why did you cut the head off the snake? Because I felt like it. And she takes a knife and throws it into a tree, and it goes really deep, right to the hilt. And the tree withers and dies. I said, why did you kill the tree? Because I felt like it. And she grabs the knife again, and there's a, a, a child running away and she and she throws it and stabs the child in the back and kills it. And I ask her why she did that, because she felt like it. If we do everything we feel like doing, 
without looking at the consequences of what we're doing, we're never going to change. You have to look at the consequences of your actions and how they're affecting people around you. And she spins and pulls all that stuff in back into the orb, all the f f f petals, all the, the, like the dagger, the, the, whole, the whole scene, and pulls it back into this orb. And it's the world. It looks like the it looks like Earth spinning in her in the palm of her hand. This is the world that you live in. And she and she literally blows blackness in it and suffocates the planet, and it dies. And this is the world that you live in. And I see people coughing and spitting and like it's just like they're just having a hard time breathing. So which world do you want to live in? And, it, and, and it's like, well, this is easy, but how do people... Obviously, I want to live in a world that is blue, healthy. Well, at the same time, that world was full of people that just think of themselves. I want to live in a world, and I, and I create a world myself, and it right, it's above the rest, and it's a world that's clean, that people work together, that do not destroy, but instead enhance. I want to live in a world like this. So can you help us get to create this world? She combines the two worlds together, like the, the dead world and the other world that was full of people. And I said, when you work with the energies you're working with now, and this is not just me, it's not necessarily you, it's the world. If you continue to work with these energies, you're never going to be able to achieve what, I, what I'm showing you. She wants us to be in a world of peace and people working together and enhance the world. And she shows a world that's like a massive city that has no life anymore. It's just a massive city. This is more like what your world will look like if you continue down that road. And you will not be able to leave. Like, they, it's, it's almost like there's going to be, if we destroy this world, there's going to be a blockade around our solar system where we will not be able to leave. And if we try, we will be destroyed. Literally. It's not a threat. It's, it's, it's not coming. I, like, one of the things i got to make very clear, they're not threatening us. They're just trying to warn us that it's not, it's not, you can't just destroy a planet like Earth without having consequences to your race. It's not science, it's not Star Trek we're talking about where people can destroy a world and get away with it. There's consequences to that. To everyone that lives on that Earth. It doesn't mean that some people won't be allowed to leave. But very few people will. This is a kind of a dire warning in a way. But it's like she, she's saying it's not a warning even, it's just a fact. She's talking, like there's a lot of, like... She's not super emotional about any of this. 
Because it's not meant to be emotional. It's just meant to tell you a story, a message about facts, about the reality. Like, what is it going to take for you to realize that the things you're doing to the world are completely off balance, unsustainable? Like, she, she's actually talking to us like, we're children that aren't listening. But it's not in a way that is condescending and rude. It's a way of love. She's very, very loving. But it's just, how do you portray a message that is not loving? I could sit there and, and and she could sit there and throw beautiful energy at you and smile and 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 just be wonderful. But the reality is that you're not the people that are here to change the world wanting are wanting to leave the world without really trying to change the world. So the people that are out there that are they call themselves light workers, most of them are wanting to leave. They're wanting to run away and hide. They want to live in a fantasy world. Instead of actually seriously working to change the world. To live in the physical world to change their direction of the human race. That's why, the, that's why you came here. So why are you all wanting to run and hide? What are you all afraid of? It's like, yeah, the world is not a nice place. You knew that before you came here. If you leave this world without trying to do the things that you came here to do, you're going to be really disappointed in yourselves. It's going to be like, oh my God, you're kidding me. That was actually not near as difficult as I thought it would was. Why was I going, I know things were hard, and I knew I, things were hard before I even came down here to help. So when things got hard, why, am I, why was I so lost in it? And I explained to the avions that because the world and the physical is so much different than in the spiritual. Sometimes you really don't get it until you're here and you go, oh shit. Oh yeah, that's what it's like. God. I forgot. Or it's like when you talk about war a hundred years later. You look at the Roman Empire, it's almost like it's um, the war scenes and stuff are glamorized. It wasn't glamorous. It was a nightmare of death. Stench was unbearable. Fighting for hours and hours. You were filthy, you stunk. You, you were covered in blood. It wasn't glamorous at all. But you can't actually show that in the movie. I guess they're moving that direction a little more. But it really doesn't show the pain and the suffering of the people. War is never glamorous. So that's what it's like when you our spirit, you know how hard things are, but 
you kind of forget how hard things are when you come back down. And it's like when you're in the physical world, you even know how easy it is to pull yourself out, but sometimes it's just so, you get lost in the emotions, you get lost in the depression. And it's much easier than you think, but you, there's a part of yourself that just doesn't want to friggin' do it anymore. But we have to. We have to keep going. We have to keep standing up for why we came here. Otherwise, it, you're going to be sorely disappointed in yourself. what the message is it's not quite what I had thought it was going to be but it's about life and the importance of living it and that's been coming very loud lately in a lot of my journeys is that we need to live our life in this world that's why we came here we didn't come here to leave if we want to become awakened, we have to live our life the way we're meant to live it. And if we want to awaken the planet, that's how we do it, by getting people to just live and change the way they're thinking, to change the, the belief systems, to change the structure of their everyday life, to help people become better people, not to run away and hide, not to keep our heads in the clouds, but to live. Thank you very much, everyone. And if you wish to do a journey with me, you can visit my website at almondrossthewakening.com. I have a Facebook page, Joseph Bradley Roars, as well as um, my website, josephbradleyroars.com and hiddenaurorspirits.com. Always remember to be good to each other, to smile, to help each other out. Take care. Have a great evening.